Secondary School Chemistry I attended Truro School between 1990 and 1995 and in the first year, aged 11 to 12, we had our first lessons in chemistry, which was taught to us in a very professional-looking lab for the time, by a professor called Jim Clark. The man was, shall we say, extremely hard. For a start, one of his main principles was that he would not teach anyone if they were younger than 14. Chemistry is dangerous. It is far too advanced for people who are not studying at least GCSEs, i.e. 14, which mostly, was written in law anyway, that, indeed, you cannot do much with 11 to 13 year olds, and he was an expert A-level professor anyway. He'd bother to give you enough to cover some end of year exam or two, which he also set himself anyway, but that was about the end of it, so you mainly had to blag and request, he told you something, else you may well end up sitting in silence for the entire 45 minute lesson. He was the kind of teacher that you would go in, sit down, get your book out and he would be at his table reading a book for 10 minutes before any chalk was used or words were conveyed. If you said anything, he may well tell you to read your textbook or even clear off to the library. I think once he was planning to submit an end-of-year exam where you could pick paper, A, or B, whereas paper A, had one question only, but several possible answers and you had to give your opinion as to why the one answer you could write to formulate an answer was the best, so you can list the other answers you reasoned were not the one you chose, or just reason your one best answer, but not make it clear if you found any others, in fear or prestige that the others you may list were actually better in his opinion, or not, and that you were stupid enough to not know anything other than the only one you reasoned was possible. Or Paper B A straightforward 10-question paper, which allowed a minimum 6 minutes per question but had a time limit of 45 minutes for the whole exam. With 10 marks possible for each question, you may want to nail the 7 questions you could do for a maximum possible 70%. Or take as many marks as you could from part answering anything up to all 10 of those questions. And, well, okay, I'll make sure the pass mark is set to something low, like 40%. And paper A will be 70% to pass, because I'll go easy on students who chose that one. I can't remember if the headmaster let him, but something akin to paper B was the structure of the end of year exam, which is all it was, no qualification awarded for passing, however, with hindsight, perhaps elevated my intellect no end. Despite this, there were some gems of knowledge that he departed. Without writing this down, I can remember this lesson from 1991. Sometimes he would say that now and again, we'll have a lesson where we can ask him anything. He will aim to answer us in words only, and will fail if he has to get equipment out to explain the answer. So if he had to set up an experiment with apparatus to explain the answer, we had beaten him. Not that anyone was ever going to try, because despite his lean appearance, it was quite obvious to even the most secluded 11-year-old that he could beat the shit out of a horse if he felt like it. One experiment he told us about I use to this day to help me with my own science papers I write as a hobby, and it involved clamping gold and silver together in the back of a lab for a number of years or even decades, before they removed it from the safe to find that entire atoms of element has moved from one side to the other so that specks of silver could be seen amongst the gold and gold amongst the silver. Because they'd been clamped together industrially hard. Plus, some building work nearby or pneumatic drilling in the street adjacent to this lab at the back of the 20th century would have helped free up space in the parameters of time and space. As an 11-year-old, you were amazed by the kind of things he spoke about, which to him, were nothing special. One day someone asked him what would happen if someone perhaps, broke a thermometer, and this dangerous stuff called mercury poured out of it. Would it react with anything in the average room? Or even the air? If you spilt some, would you need to keep anything particularly away from it to stop it reacting into something else? Or becoming even more dangerous? A typical 11-year-old student's question. He said this. It would not react with anything in a typical room, whether you're supposed to have a thermometer or jug of mercury in that room or not. So you could have it open. However, it would mainly be sealed because of the viscous nature of it, indeed, when it is in a big enough amount to become a ball, it will slide everywhere and anywhere it can, but will refuse to travel upwards against gravity, i.e. it doesn't like bouncing. But on a, say, hardwood surface, it acts almost like a superconductor and look, he then snapped a thermometer between his fingers, poured some out onto the table in front of me and my two friends at the front of the class and nudged it across the desk at superconductor speeds, whilst we frantically tried to catch it. 
safely between two plastic rulers and about eight fingers. He berated us for the poor choice of materials used, that fingers and plastic were the literal worst things and that paper or a textbook would have been easier and better, and then ended his answer with this. You see how quickly it can disappear. I don't mind if this mercury gets lost in here, this is a state-of-the-art lab. If you lose an amount like this in an average room, it will run underneath a cupboard or furniture and may be safe for a while, but this stuff will stay there. In years to come, you may think it's safe enough to bring something else into that room which also passes your question of the average room, and so nothing ordinary will become dangerous if I spill it type scenario, however, you will have not sealed off the room before you found it. It may then be dangerous if you assume it has made its way elsewhere. As you may be able to read about in textbooks that describe the effects of mercury poisoning on the brain. He quickly scooped up the mercury in his hand, like scraping it off the table into his other hand, and then dumped it all into the sink and washed his hands. Two weeks later the deputy head, who was a bit of an idiot, walked in and said, Excuse me Jim, I've had a report that you split a thermometer open in front of these children recently and poured mercury out on a desk. He said, No. Fairly sternly, with a very direct Lawrence Force-esque sideways shrug with his jawline. The deputy head turned around and left through the same door that hadn't even closed yet. Now, for the fact he was our chemistry teacher for a year, and this is all I can remember, this is, really, all I've ever needed to know about first-year chemistry.